Good morning. Welcome to the online ministry of Pidcock United Methodist Church. Pidcock United Methodist Church is located on FM 116 at 11230 FM 116, about halfway between Gatesville and Coppers Cove. We appreciate you being with us for our online ministry and hang on because there's going to be an announcement in just a little bit about when we're going to be uh, commencing on-site services again. So have a hold on for that announcement and we hope you'll be, be with us. Before we begin this time together, I want to share a few announcements with you. As I said, we are planning to, to recommence on-site services. July 5th is our target date. That's the first Sunday in July. We're going to begin our meeting that morning at 9 a.m. We're going to try to beat the heat. We're going to be meeting outside our fellowship hall under the trees, uh, outside the fellowship hall to try to stay as cool as we can. Uh, Please plan to bring a lawn chair. If, you, if you're going to join us, bring a lawn chair or a blanket or something you can sit on or plan to sit in your car because we're not going to be providing tables or chairs for people to sit at just to minimize the amount of things that we have to sanitize uh, for protection. Uh, watch our website uh, and our Facebook page for more information. Uh, guidelines for what to do to be safe, how you can participate safely, uh, have been posted to Facebook and to our website and have also been sent out an email uh, to our members uh, and many of those who are interested in the church otherwise. So plan to be with us if you can on July the 5th at 9 a.m. We're continuing to move forward with an abundance of caution. As conditions hopefully improve, our next phase will be, hold, to be, will be to hold services in our sanctuary with reduced seating so that we can maintain pop, proper physical distancing and so that we can also uh, do the sanitizing that we need to do in order to make sure uh, that those who are with us, our members and our guests, are kept safe. Our Tuesday evening Bible study group uh, will continue to meet. We had our first meeting with our, uh, our study on Daniel this past Tuesday evening. We will continue to use the search questions in the workbook that we have for this study. Uh, those search questions will guide our, our time through the book and also be those things that, that help our discussion or keep our, give us a framework for our discussion as we go through that study. If you'd like to join us, contact me and we'll uh, make arrangements to get us to one of the study guides to you. Uh, or if you just want to come sit in on the conversations, uh, let me know and I'll be glad to send you the Zoom link uh, for those meetings. Until such time as we, can, we feel that we can be back together safely uh, in, in a physical way, we'll, uh, we'll continue to do those meetings uh, through Zoom. Uh, we can give you that link and you can join in uh, and be part of that discussion. Now let's begin our time of worship together this morning uh, with our affirmation of faith. It's our practice to begin our, our time of worship together with the Apostles' Creed. So as you either recite or read the Apostles' Creed, let's do that together. And at the end of that, we'll join together in singing, Glory be to the Father. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Father, we come to you this morning with thankful hearts for the earthly fathers you have given to be our guides, mentors, and friends. Thank you for those men who are not our fathers, but who have played a fatherly role in our lives. 
Thank you for those mothers who've had to do double duty as both mother and father. Theirs is a daunting task, and we pray you bless and strengthen them in it. As we think of the fathers who've gone on before us into your presence, we're grateful for the time you gave us with them. For those of us who are fathers, we pray that we can remain faithful to our calling as we seek to set an example before our sons and daughters that they will feel safe and emulating. Now bless us in this time of worship and instruction, that we may be drawn closer to you, our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And now join me in the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ gave us as a model for our prayers, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On Friday, we commemorated Juneteenth. Juneteenth marks June 19, 1865, when the Emancipation Proclamation was first read and declared law in Texas. Texas was the last state in the Union to receive the, the proclamation, and that ended, officially ended slavery in all of the United States. It's been celebrated by our African American community for generations, but this year, because of some of the events that are going on around us, the rest of us are aware of it more so this year than we probably ever have been and have paid more attention to it. One of the things that, that you can observe as we've take, paid attention to it this year is that the promise of Juneteenth, the emancipation of, peoples, of people of color, has not been fully realized. I pray that we, all of us together, will work toward a day when all Americans will be equal, given equal opportunity, equal protections under the law, and equal respect that is due every child of God, every person who is created by God in God's image and is of sacred worth to God. And now if you would, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. Again, this is Matthew, chapter 10. I'm going to begin reading in verse 24. <clears throat> Matthew, chapter 10. In verse 24. And I'll read down to the end of that in that passage, which is verse 39. So Matthew chap, chapter 10, verses 24 to 39. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough that the disciple be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of the household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear, what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. <clears throat> Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> As we look at this passage of Scripture, what we're seeing here is Jesus relaying to his disciples the cost of discipleship. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 10 begins 
with Jesus commissioning and sending out the 12 into the harvest. Those who would be his primary messengers, first to, first to Israel and then to the Gentiles. These who would carry the gospel, they would be, they were the proto-evangelist, if you will. <clears throat> Those who were the very first to carry the message. And he's showing them, these are the things that you need to be cognizant of. These are the things you need to be aware of as you go out because there are things that you need to know. There are things that you need to be prepared for because you're not going out into a world that really wants to hear what you've got to say or really wants to receive you. So here are the things that he tells to them. Here he makes five statements about the cost of discipleship. So as we look at these verses, I'd like to take those five statements and just very briefly look at each one of them to see just what these costs are. Because I believe that as they were for the 12 apostles who went out in that very first mission endeavor, so they are for us today. Because the principles of discipleship, the cost of discipleship, if you will, have not changed. So let's look at these verses of Scripture and see what this is going to cost us. First of all, in verses 24 to 25, we see that there's the cost of humility. None of us likes to be insulted. None of us likes to be called names. None of us likes to be ridiculed. None of us likes to be thought less of than we are. So Jesus tells his disciples, he said, you're not better than your master, just like a disciple is not better than his teacher. You're not better than your master, just like a slave, a servant is not better than his master. The idea of ranking under someone else grates on us as Americans. We don't like to be second. We don't like to be under command or under authority. We like to call our own shots. We like to think of ourselves as rugged individualists, those who, who are captains of our own fate. And yet, Jesus, our teacher, our Lord, tells us that if we're going to be his disciples, we need to remember who we are and remember our place. Our place is not to have a will of our own, but it's to surrender our will to the will of our master. It's to surrender our thoughts, our desires, our plans, our hopes for the future into the hands of the one who guides and directs and instructs us. I say it's the cost of humility. Quite literally, it's the cost of humbling ourselves, of emptying ourselves, even as Jesus emptied himself as Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2. So that he became, he says he made himself of no reputation. So we see not only the cost of being humble, the cost of, the cost of humility, but we see the cost of lost reputation. In verses 26 through 28, Jesus talks about, talks about how the master is maligned. The master is, is run down, criticized, ridiculed. He says, but have, don't have any fear of them, for nothing, nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. He's saying, don't worry about these people. They're going to talk about you. They're going to call you names. They're going to spread rumors about you. They're going to lie about you. They're going to lie to you. But don't worry about that. Because what they are will ultimately be revealed. He said, don't worry about them because they can't hurt you. He said, oh, no, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know about martyrs. I know about Christians who were fed to the lions. I know about Christians who were burned at the stake. I know about, yeah, we know about those things. But think, none of those things to the faithful disciple of Christ does permanent damage. I played football when I was in high school. And one of the things that, that, that kept me back my first couple of years, first couple of seasons that I played, is I have a very strong aversion to pain. And I knew that if I hit somebody, especially somebody who was bigger than me, if I hit them with much force or they hit me with much force, it was going to hurt. But after a little while, I figured out, you know, that helmet, those shoulder pads, those other pads that I'm wearing, yeah, it's going to hurt but there's no permanent damage. Oh sure, over the course of the years that I played, uh, there were a lot of cuts and bruises. Uh, there was a couple of broken fingers. Uh, you know, there were other things that happened to me, but there was never any permanent damage. 
The closest thing I had to any permanent damage from that is a scar that runs from here down to about here that's real faint nowadays. You can barely see it. Uh, where I got kicked in the mouth with a set of cleats once. <laughs> it hurt. It hurt a lot. And it hurt for a long time. But there was no permanent damage done. He's saying the same thing to us here. They can't destroy you. They might even kill you, but they can't destroy you. Don't worry about them. Follow me. The idea he's talking about here is, the, is, is suffering mental and emotional anguish. Losing approval, not being able to get approval. Suffering in that sense. Suffering from having things said about you that aren't true. Suffering from hearing rumors coming back that, of what people have said about you. Those things hurt, but they do no permanent damage. What was it that taught us when we were kids? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Jesus said, no worry about them. They're going to be revealed what they are and who they belong to. You just do what I've told you to do. Follow me. Then in verses 29 to 31, we see the cost of physical suffering. In verse 29, he said, he talks about the idea that there would be suffering. He said, but wait a minute. He's going back to this idea of not fearing again. He said, two sparrows are sold for a penny. They're of little worth. They're common as dirt. And we used to say things were, were common. They were a dime a dozen. They're even less than that. Two for a penny. And he said, not one of them is going to fall to the earth without your father's permission, without his knowledge, without him being, without him being right there. He said, you are of a lot more value to God than a couple of sparrows. God is in charge. God is watching over you. God is, is watching what happens to you. God is using what happens to you to further his kingdom, to increase his glory, to draw other people to Christ. Read the book of the Revelation and we find there are multitudes, multitudes of martyrs. Martyrs, those who've given their lives because of their faith in Christ. And yet we don't hear them standing around in heaven bemoaning their fate, complaining about, well, I've got this real ache over here where that sword went through me. Or I've got this, you know, my, my neck still hurts where they cut my head off. No, we hear them rejoicing and singing the praises of God. They knew that God had it the whole time. They didn't need to worry about it. They didn't need to fear it. They just needed to follow what God had said. The cost of discipleship, the cost of humility, the cost of a lost reputation, the cost of suffering. But then there's also the cost of loyalty. The cost of loyalty. Beginning in verse 32. Jesus says, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But everyone, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. We think about those who've gone before, who've been put to the test. And we wonder how in the world did they stand that? And yet I fear so often, I've experienced it myself, I fear so often we sell out a lot cheaper than our, some of our forebearers have. We deny through silence the Lord who bought us because we're afraid that someone will make fun of us or think less of us. We forbear to make comments on our social media accounts. And don't believe, believe me, I'm not a, a Facebook evangelist, but we, we fear to make comments or to answer comments because we're afraid of being, we, fear, we are fearful of being shamed off of social media. And that happens a lot today. Jesus said, don't worry about that. He said, be loyal. Don't deny me. We can deny him through silence. We can deny him through action. How many people do you know who are professing Christians and don't live like it? Many years ago, I was in a Boy Scout, a Scout leader training. And in our Cracker Barrel session one night around the campfire, one of the leaders of this, this training group said, what do you do when you have a Scout who's supposed to take the oath, uh, you know, 
you know, on my honor, I promise to do my best to do my duty to God in my country. And say, I don't believe in God. And there were all kinds of things that, that were said. And finally, I said, here's the thing. So the average Christian is a practicing atheist. We say there's a God. We say we believe in Him. We say that we follow Him, and yet we live like He doesn't exist. We deny our faith by living a life that's not consistent with the faith we say we have. And on and on and on it could go, but I want to move on. The cost of that loyalty is not only in perhaps the loss of prestige or the loss of recognition or just someone saying something bad about us and so we hold our, our peace. Or worse yet, we go into attack mode to try to protect our integrity, to try to protect our, our good name. When what we need to do is just simply live the life that we've been called to live. But there's more than that. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. I came to bring a sword. He said, there's going to be division. There's going to be separation. There's going to be, going to be people who, who you love, that you love dearly, who will leave you, who will have nothing to do with you because they don't want to hear what you have to say about Jesus. They don't believe that the life that you're living is a life that's worth living. Our loyalty has to extend beyond them. He said, if anybody loves his father and his mother more than he loves me, he's not worthy of me. Or if he loves son and daughter more than he loves me, he's not worthy of me. The cost of discipleship, the cost of loyalty is high. But that's the price that a disciple must pay. If we're going to be disciples, we have to be willing to pay the cost. And then finally, there's the cost of priorities. The cost of priorities. He said, and whoever won't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. The idea of taking up the cross as it's expressed here is the idea of picking something up to carry it. The disciples would have been very familiar with the idea of what the cross was. They would have been familiar with the, with the notion and the, really the fact that many condemned criminals who were condemned to be crucified would be forced to carry the cross beam of their cross from their judgment place to the place of crucifixion. They would be forced to carry the, own, the instrument of their own death to that place. Jesus is saying, if you're not willing to pick up the cross and follow me, if you're not willing to join this cavalcade of people that are following, of disciples that are following me, you're not worthy of me. They would have known, the disciples would have known, the cross was an instrument of death. No one who was condemned to the embrace of the nails of the cross ever dismounted the cross. They were taken down by their executioners, dead. The cross was simply, strictly and purely an instrument of death torture and death. Jesus said, if you're not willing to take up the cross and follow me, are you really my disciple? He goes on. He said, whoever finds his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The idea of finding the life is one of seeking and obtaining accruing. It has the carries with the idea of gathering wealth, gathering privilege, gathering popularity, gathering all those things that we strive for in this life. He said, if that's what you're finding, that's what you're looking for, he said, you're going to lose it. Either here in this life when it just things just fall apart. A great many of us today are looking at great financial hardship because of the shutdown of our economy, because of the, because of the pandemic. Or you're going to lose it all at the end anyway. A good friend of mine, uh, Pastor Joe Green, was raised in, in a funeral home. His father was a, uh, was a funeral director. And he said oftentimes at a funeral, someone would say something to his dad about a person who had died and say, I wonder how much he left. 
And Joe's dad would say simply, all of it. He didn't take any of you with it, with him. There's an old Italian proverb that says, a shroud, the grave clothes, have no pockets. Or to Americanize that and make it a little more colloquially, I've never seen a hearse pull in a U-Haul trailer. We leave it all. If that's what we built our life around, then it ends at the grave. But he said, if we lose our lives, if we forego those things, taking those things that God blesses us with and using them for His glory, we find that life is found. This idea of loyalty is one that, that uh, bears some examination. The idea of being having the right priorities. Pliny the Younger was the Roman governor of Bithynia in what's now Turkey during the second century when the Emperor Trajan began a, a wicked persecution of Christians in the empire, the Roman Empire, that lasted off and on for 300 years until Constantine came on the scene and made, made Christianity a recognized religion in the, in the empire. Pliny wrote to, wrote to Trajan about how he treated Christians in his realm. Anonymous informers would <clears throat> pass along information about certain people who were Christian. Pliny tells how he gave these people the opportunity to invoke the gods of Rome, to offer wine and frankincense to the image of Caesar. Remember, Caesar was worshiped, at least legally, was worshiped as a god. And how he demanded as a final cost for them to be, for them to be set free that they curse the name of Christ. He said this, he said, none of these acts, it is said, those who are really Christian can be compelled to do. He said, we can't force them to do these things. We can't cajole them into it. We can't threaten them into it. We can't bribe them into it. They just won't do it. <clears throat> Wielding all the power of Roman authority, the governor had to admit, he had to admit that he couldn't shake the loyalty of those who were truly disciples of Jesus. Is our loyalty that strong? It all depends on whether we've truly accepted the call to pay the price of discipleship, to bear the cost. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian and pastor in the days when Hitler and the National Socialist, the Nazis, were coming to power in Germany. He opposed the National Socialist from the very beginning and called on the church in Germany to stand against their stated purpose of setting up a Fuhrer who would basically be worshiped as God, who sought to replace Christianity with a state-run religion that was based on paganism. Because he was constantly under pressure from the, from the Nazis, constantly being hounded, first taught he couldn't, it's first denied the right to teach then denied the right to speak in public, then denied the right to publish any of his works. Bonhoeffer was given the opportunity to come to America to get away from the Nazis. So in 1939, he sailed for New York City. He arrived in New York City. His friends expected him to stay for at least three years, which would have meant he would have been safe at least through the end of the war. But after 26 days, Bonhoeffer went back to Germany because his impression was, he was so deeply impressed that that was where God wanted him, that he needed to be there to stand with the German church, to stand with those who were standing against the Nazis, to stand with those who were being faithful to their confession in Christ. Ultimately, Bonhoeffer was hung by the Nazis, hung in a prison camp where he'd been kept just days before that camp was liberated, liberated by the American army in April of 1945. Along the way, he left a trail of principled opposition to the evils of National Socialism in general and Adolf Hitler in particular. He never wavered in his adherence to the highest principles of Christian discipleship. As a prisoner for almost two years, he was a pastor and a caregiver to those who were imprisoned with him even extending that care to the guards who many times would apologize to him for having to lock him back in a cell. He was offered freedom <clears throat> for cooperation, 
If he remained quiet, they'd let him go. And yet he was adamant in his opposition, which was based on his interpretation of what Christ expected from him as a disciple. Threatened with torture and death, he acknowledged the power that the Nazis had to take away his life. But he chose rather to stand for the truth of Scripture, even though these things confronted him. In the end, even his executioners were impressed with the humility and courtesy that he extended to them as they led him to the scaffold and hung him there. Dietrich Bonhoeffer lost his life for Christ and as a result found life as a shining example of steadfast witness to the power of Christ and His truth in the life of a disciple. In his 1937 book, The Cost of Discipleship, from which I borrowed the title of this sermon, he wrote these words that have become seared on my heart, seared on my mind as a challenge to me to be the disciple I'm called to be. Bonhoeffer wrote this, he said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. This is the true cost of discipleship. Are we willing to bear the cost? Let's pray. Almighty God, none of us wants to die. To live is the strongest desire in each of us, and it's the way you've made us. Still, we know that you've called us to give up our lives that we may enter into the life of, of our Lord Jesus Christ and be his true disciples. You've called us to die to this world and to ourselves to be alive only in Christ. May we be able to say with Paul that the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. If you'd like to know more about the subject of this sermon or would just like to, you have questions that you'd like to, like to discuss, please give me a call. You'll see my phone number at the end of this video presentation. Shoot me an email. My email address is there and I'll be happy to discuss those things with you. If you'd not like to know more about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, I'll be happy to share that with you as well. Now I ask you to receive this benediction. Christ has called us to come and die. The Father has called us to live in the midst of death. The Spirit calls us to new life, lived by faith in the Son of God. Therefore, empowered by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, go forth, protected by the love of God, and live in the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit.